Welcome to our viewers and listeners. This is episode number 11 of Coronavirus Conversations. And my usual guest slash partner in crime slash co-host, Josh Williamson. Um, so Josh, how are you doing today? I'm good, thanks Adam. Thank, thanks for carving out time in your schedule. Um, so just so people are aware, so Josh, why don't you go through just a typical day now in your life as in the Gable Health Center? <laughs> Um, well, typical day, um, we open up at 8.30, so, um, so when I get here at 8.30, um, I wonder whether or not there's going to be messages on the phone uh, prior to 8.30 for people with concerns or issues overnight. Um, we've had a lot of days where um, things happened the night before, and so I'm aware of them. So um, today was one of those days where I came in knowing that we had some uh, stuff to sort out and some... Uh, uh, some patients to, to try to figure out whether or not um, what we need to do with them basically. Um, I always have scheduled patients during the day um, and and then we kind of work through those with uh, throwing in um, ones that call that need to come in. Obviously if there's a COVID issue on campus we get them in mm -hmm. um, as quickly as possible to get um, to make sure that um, um, that we can keep camp the campus safe and and to get those patients whatever they need um, Obviously the first thing is to to see how sick um, a Patient is that's the first priority. Uh, I always tell them that their their health is uh, is my first priority that my second priority is to try to keep COVID-19 uh, As far from campus as I, I possibly can <laughs> right, right. So that's, that's about that's typically. about it and, and, and so you typically see patients throughout the day, right? Yes, yeah. All right, and then, so we have a special guest today. Um, so as many of you are aware, we initially started as, you know, focused very, very closely on the medical and sort of scientific aspects of this. But we have the benefit of being at a small liberal arts college. And so we are trying to branch out and, you know, learn about uh, the pandemic from different angles. And so today we are very pleased to have uh, Brenda Ingram Wallace with us. So she is um, a PhD. She's the associate, uh, she's an associate professor of psychology with an expertise in clinical and, uh, see, clinical and counseling psychology. And using that expertise, she's also the director of the Albright College Counseling Center. So thank you, Brenda, and welcome. Thank you, thank you for having me. So today we thought we would talk about a very, very important aspect of the pandemic as related to mental health. So how are things going at the counseling center? Um, they're going, they are going. We have um, a number of students that are coming in. We're booked, most weeks we're fully booked, if not just a few appointments open, booking into weeks, upcoming weeks as well. Um, students coming in for typical issues, not just issues around the pandemic, but you know, we also have the day-to-day -day things that students may be involved in or concerned about, and then on top of that, the pandemic, and then on top of that, the impending elections, and we're preparing for that, and we have some special things we're going to be doing through the Counseling Center for that as well. So there's always issues that are arising that we're addressing as they show up, and making sure that we provide optimal mental health services for our students. Are you currently, is it mainly all telehealth? Are you still doing some in person? Like what's the arrangement right now? Right now we're primarily doing in person. Um, the telehealth piece for Albright has been an adventure, an IT adventure, not so much an adventure for us. Um, so we are still working on telehealth and our goal is to roll out telehealth the week of elections. Um, because there's lots of anxiety and emotions around this particular election, the Counseling Center is, we're opening up open hours. Um, the entire week of elections week. So from Monday to, through Friday, specifically from two to three every day, we will have drop-in hours. So students can call in if they're interested and um, either walk in, but we're preferring to do telehealth at that time so we can move expeditiously and just quick debriefing and giving them an opportunity for a little additional support if they're having issues around the elections. But that's gonna be our rollout of telehealth. So we're doing all everything, either uh, mostly face-to-face -face and a few by phone calls right now, um, depending on the student's needs and their location. And Josh, so so I'm so so I'm not aware. So you can educate me and and, and our listeners. 
Is, is there a sort of formal arrangement between Gable and the counseling center? Like, do you communicate on, on certain like needs? Uh, yes, um, very, very closely, actually. It's, a, it's been a, um, an enjoyable part of what I do here. Um, we're fortunate, to, fortunate enough to have count, counselors on campus uh, every day. Um, and I get to work closely with the counselors. So um, um, because a lot of students don't have access um, to their primary care provider, a lot of students um, through insurance issues and well, all the issues that, um, that we're having in our country with, with mental health care, um, it can take months for um, our students to, to have an appointment with a psychiatrist. So, um, so I'm here to, to kind of bridge the gap. Um, so I do um, um, refill prescriptions for students that, um, that are, aren't able to, to have um, follow up with um, their psychiatrists or their primary care providers. Uh, and then ones that don't have um, access to that or that are waiting, um, I do initiate uh, medical treatment um, um, in conjunction with, um, with the counselors here on campus. So I, I refer a lot of students to the counselors and a lot of, um, a lot of the counselors refer students back to me uh, to discuss uh, the possibility of medical treatment. So it's a, it's a great relationship actually. Oh, neat. Okay, I didn't know that, very cool. Adam, can I talk a little bit about the structure of the Counseling Center? Absolutely, yeah. um, I am the director and my role is primarily administrative and to handle other issues that come up. We have four counselors in the Counseling Center and as Josh has said, we have somebody there every day. Sometimes there's two people, somebody in the morning and somebody in the afternoon. Um, and we <clears throat> have the equivalent of 42.5 hours for the week. So it's the equivalent of having one full-time person there across the time. Um, and we have a diversity of males and females as well as uh, an ethnic um, counselor as well. Students get the first available appointment. Um, so wh whenever they call, wherever we have a slot, we just kind of put them in. If we have a waiting list, we give them the first available appointment. But what typically happens is, even if they're scheduled out for a couple of weeks, if we have a cancellation, we'll call them right in and they get in much quicker than that. And I have been directing the counseling center for about 18 years now. So that's the configuration that we have had and it's worked very well for us. Okay. And, and I can help but smile because I know that Brenda does deal with a lot of questions. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> even though she's um, not physically here, she is handling a lot of, uh, of what goes on with the counseling center on a daily basis. Absolutely. Absolutely. Gotcha. And so, so we were talking about this briefly in sort of the pre-show prep, but I think it's interesting. Uh, so obviously we have a lot of students from across state lines. Yes. So yeah. can you just give us a quick rundown of how that works with like the laws? And my understanding at least is um, during the pandemic, some states have relaxed some of their licensing laws, right? Where you can get some arrangements to, to, to work with people in other states. Like, so how does that work and how does that affect the counseling center? Well, let's roll back to March when the pandemic first hit. So when the pandemic first hit, well, prior to the pandemic, reciprocity was very low across lines, which means if you were licensed in Pennsylvania, you work in Pennsylvania. And if you wanted to work in another state, you had to get licensed in that state as well. When the pandemic hit, because there wasn't already that reciprocity, there had to, they had to do something quickly. So again, it was state by state. So we had to go through and check a listing, several listings actually, every day to figure out who we can talk to, who we could not talk to, who we could provide services for, who we had to triage, you know, what, what our, our, our um, parameters were. Uh, so I was actually meeting with the counselors weekly so that they would have a, an accurate list of if there's a student in Tennessee, if there's a student in Massachusetts, if there's a student in California, what will we be able to offer them? Um, because the pandemic is now extending so long, some of the states that originally had relaxed everything and as long as you were licensed anywhere, you could practice there, now have reverted to the original um, law. So really we still, it's a day by day okay. kind of update as to who we can see. Um, so when we have a student, but what will happen for us is if we have a student in any state that reaches out or has distress, we reach out to them within our confines. So we don't just leave a student out there hanging if they need us in some way. So we will reach out and we'll explain to them what we're able to provide or not provide. And then if we cannot provide services in that state, we can help them 
to find resources in their state. So we're always available to do that if we can't provide the frontline services for them. Wow, that, that sounds like a full-time job just in and of itself. <laughs> it was, it is. <laughs> yeah. Wow, okay. Whew. Right, so yeah, I know my, uh, so, so I should so, sort of interject. So my, my, my wife is a, a CID, which is a, a doctor of um, clinical psychology, and she's been doing telehealth a lot, and she's been sharing with me some of these things, and because she's had a few clients, you know, who are in college or mm -hmm. whatever, moved home, and then they're in a different state, and yeah, it's very interesting. Yes, it, 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 it's a challenge. Yeah, yeah, um, and and I guess because I have a wife who's a who's a psychologist, I know a little bit of the jargon. So, like, do you have do you have clinicians or or, count, or um, uh, counselors that? specialize in say like a, um, a cognitive behavioral therapy, CBT, is, this, is it like psychodynamic? Is it, is it like just like sort of like talk therapy or does it just depend on the student's needs? It depends on the student's needs. We have a brief model um, because we are a college counseling center and we have limited hours. So we see students for up to eight sessions per year. Okay. Um, some kind of way that got translated to every student gets eight sessions, which is not the case. <laughs> it is up to eight sessions per year. So if we, we see a student and we can tell, you know, right off the bat that they're just going to need something more intensive than we're going to be able to offer in the long run, then we assist them in getting plugged in to treaters in the community. Okay. And as we do that, we, <clears throat> excuse me, we also case manage them. So once we get them connected, it's not that we just kind of wash our hands and say, good luck with that. But we also have them to meet with one of our counselors every three weeks, four weeks, depending on the situation, so that they have someone on campus that they're familiar with. And if there's a crisis that they can plug into rather quickly. And we also monitor, are they getting what they need? Are they attending their sessions? And you know, they, we just manage the case on campus. Um, so that's another service that we offer. Um, but in terms of what we provide, it really depends on the student. I have um, all four of my counselors are generalists, so okay. they have a lot of tools in their arsenal and they've been practicing for many, many years. Um, so they can do all of what you've listed, cognitive behavioral, yeah. really psychodynamic and more, cool. um, depending on the student's needs. Yeah, it, it didn't dawn on me just because, you know, my wife is sort of more specialized, right. um, but whereas a college counseling center has, has different needs. So That's yeah, right. I'm glad we're having this conversation. It makes yeah. total sense. Yeah. Yep, absolutely. Uh, Brenda, did you want to go through some of your slides that you, that you brought? Sure, uh, sure. I would love to. I'll share my screen now and just kind of walk through some of the dynamics that we're seeing. Okay, so this is some data from a study that was conducted by the Center of Collegiate Mental Health. And anxiety continues to be the number one mental health concern for college students with depression and mood disorders as a close um, second. Um, in 2019, it was found that over half of college age students were feeling hopeless and over 10% were actually contemplating suicide. Self-injury is also something that we see pretty prevalently on college campuses. And everything that I'm talking about, even though I'm talking about national trends, these are also things that we see on our campus as well. Um, suicide attempts, suicide ideation. We have not had, um, because of, I think, a, a lot of things that we have in place here at Albright, we have been able to be very proactive with students that are having suicidal ideation and not get even to the attempt component as frequently as we could if we weren't making those kinds of interventions. Um, the use of co uh, counseling on college campuses continually increases. There's a national trend and a lot of campuses will say we can't keep up with the demand and especially now that we're in this COVID season, of course, you know, things have kind of heightened some, but even before that, um, because a lot of students come from high schools where they've, or even uh, middle schools and elementary schools where they've been in treatment for years. They've had psychiatric services for years. So they're coming to campus already having been exposed to this with the expectation that they will be able to continue to access these services as they 
here on college campuses. Um, eating disorders and eating concerns continue to increase and family distress. Um, that's one that is continually increasing over the years. So when students are entering college, they're not just, you know, people think about the happy go lucky. Oh, I just leave home and I'm able to, you know, party and, and, and do my academics or whatever. But a lot of students are also dealing with severe issues at home that have just been exacerbated with the advent of COVID, like financial issues, parents losing jobs, parents having health issues, significant health issues, and even parents that are um, dying during the course of their time as a college student, um, having to work on campus to send money back home to assist with the financial situation at home, having parents that are divorcing, having parents that have their own psychiatric history, having siblings that may be in danger because of the community that they come from or things that are happening in the home. So lots of family distress in addition to all of the other things um, that we have, um, we have shared. There was another um, study, and this is one of the studies that's predominant now, the Healthy Mind Study. And that was a study that was conducted with 3,000 students and in a response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Now this data was collected at the end of the spring semester. So this is not fall um, 2020 data. This is data that was collected um, earlier. Um, but that there was worsened mm -hmm. mental health status for a significant number of students, including 20% that said that their mental health signif was significantly impacted. And then over half of the students didn't know where to go for help. Now I hope that is not the, the case on our campus. We have tried really, really hard to be very diligent in letting students know uh, where we are and the services that we have to offer. I sent something out to all the students um, about a month ago, just reminding them of our services. I've spoken to FYS classes and other individuals. So if someone doesn't know how to access us, that would make me very sad, but we would keep working on it. <laughs> Um, another thing that I think is interesting to, to um, kind of note is that students are very concerned um, about COVID-19. So in addition to doing their academics, and this is whether they're at home or whether they're on campus, that some of their concerns, and, and we're talking about, if you look at the dark blue bar, that is very or extremely concerned. In this particular study, the question was, are you concerned about how long the pandemic will last? How many people will be affected? And if people that you care about will be affected. And you see that that blue bar is consistently very high and that's very or extremely concerned about those things. So our students, in addition to dealing with their academics and all the other things that they may be dealing with, they're concerned, especially about their loved ones, parents, grandparents, and will they contract the, the disease and the, dis, the um, disorder and what will be the implications of that? And we've already dealt with students that have lost loved ones as a result of the pandemic. Um, this particular study talked about parallel pandemics, and I thought that this was real interesting because we're all thinking about just COVID, but in addition to COVID for college students, here's what we're seeing. Increase in anxiety, increase in depression, increase in PTSD symptomatology, increase in eating disorders, and increase in drug use, not alcohol use, which I think is, again, very interesting. We're not seeing alcohol use is pretty much remaining the same in terms of college students, but using marijuana, smoking, nicotine, vaping, all of those things, we're continually seeing an increase with those things. So we have a number of different pandemics if you want, or implications of the pandemic for college students that we are contending with. So again, the current stressors on our campus, if we look at what's happening for all Bright students and students in particular, we have the pandemic, we have the decrease in athletics, which was a great stress reliever for a lot of students. And you know, there are college campuses where they're not participating in that now. We have national racial tension. So the whole issue of safety and, and how we deal with differences, both on campus and off campus, extreme violence toward African-Americans, which again, 
has another layer of anxiety and depression and other psychopathology. The impending presidential and political campaign is increasing for some people their anxiety. And then natural disasters, which sometimes get pushed to the background, but they're still happening. Hurricanes and fires, climate control. So all of these things are, are happening. And if we lump those in one category, then we also have the everyday stressors of non-COVID related deaths. You know, students are still losing people that are important to them or even pets that are important to them in addition to all of these other things. We already talked about family situations. We have food insecurity, you know, which we're doing a great job of partnering with Spring Valley Church of God and being able to bring food onto campus so that our students that are having food insecurity will have, at least if they're on campus, will have opportunities to kind of augment that with food. Housing insecurity, you know, people don't think about college students as being homeless, but there is a faction of college students that are homeless. They don't have any place else to go. They're on the campus. They may have aged out of the foster care system and don't have, a, you know, a place to go back to, or their family lost housing over, you know, the economic implications of um, the, the, um, the pandemic so that they don't know where they're going to live, employment, finances, and just life you know, everyday things that are happening. So these are all things that college students are dealing with simultaneously. You know, so when you talk about the heightened need of counseling, yes, absolutely it's there. So what do we do to build resilience? Because, you know, I've painted a pretty gloomy picture here of what's going on with students and people in the world, but there, there is some hope. You know, I wanna, I wanna leave on a note or talk about some things that we can do. So in another study, they found four things that bolster resilience and increase um, um, positive well-being in students. And the first one is self-control. You know, the more that they can have control over their environment, their cells, what they they do their schedule, things like that, that it helps the, with their mental health and helps to augment their mental health. Also academic engagement, you know, to be able to thrust themselves into their academics and kind of have a focus for their attention and the work that they need to do. And that's why one of the things that, again, I want to applaud Albright on is um, with our new Aviso system, if there is disengagement, we're being alerted very early, you know, sometimes to the annoyance of students. Oh my God, they're reaching out to me. I only missed two classes, but you know, with our current configuration, two classes, that's a lot of the semester, right. but we're getting to the students earlier, you know, and we're, we're reaching out, you know, for better or for worse, but we're letting them know that we're concerned and that we care. And because we know that academic engagement is going to improve their mental health. Also having self-compassion, and this is one that's difficult for everyone, you know, myself included, being able to just give yourself grace to say, you know, this is a difficult time for everyone. This is unusual in our generation, it's unprecedented. So we do, we've never had anything this large, even though there have been pandemics and, and that have impacted us so that we can have the appropriate coping mechanisms. So I always say to everyone, including my staff, let's just start from here. We're going to make mistakes. You know, it's not going to be perfect. So give yourself some grace and whatever it is, we'll work through it. You know, but students being able to do that, you know, if you working on a paper and you lose your paper, don't just go to the place of, oh my God, you know, I'm going to fail, but reach out to that professor and say, you know, I, I tried. I had six pages done and it just blinked off of my computer. Trust me, there's none of us who haven't been there. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a very important time. So we understand that being able to give yourself that grace and to say, you know, things are going to happen. I'm going to make mistakes. I'm not going to be able, I may not be able to handle that. We're all going to have some rough days. You need to know that you may need a mental health day. You know, I'm at the point in my life, in the season of my life, I know when it's happening and I, I'm the first to say, okay, this is my mental health day or this is my mental health time and that's it, you know, but to be able to have that self-compassion and not be so hard on yourself about not being able to either meet deadlines or to accomplish goals in the way that you want it to, or, you know, not to get to that next step at the time frame that you wanted to, to be able to give yourself that grace. And then lastly, 
having meaningful relationships. In another study, one of the things that they found is that um, uh, uh, social media usage is at an all time high, you know, not that it wasn't already for this population, but just at an all time high, which is okay, but looking for meaningful relationships, not just, you know, oh, I, I'm texting this person or, you know, I'm talking to this person on social media. I don't know who they are, where they are, what's going on, but really having some significant relationships so that you can have some significant conversations and be at a point if you need it to receive that support and have someone in your life that you can be vulnerable with. So it's really important that students start to develop if they don't already have them, either with parents or extended family, friends, um, significant others, but find that space where you can be you no matter what, where people will accept you, the good, the bad, and the otherwise, and you know that you can kind of rest in that. So those are kind of the four areas that have been found that will bolster resilience. So what are some other things that you can do? Monitor your own mental health. Nobody in the world knows you better than yourself. And whether you want to acknowledge it or not, you can feel the symptoms coming on. You know, you're a little more snappy than you used to be. You know, people are getting on your nerves or situations are getting on your nerves. That That's your body and your mind is speaking to you at that time that you may need to do something a little bit different. The other thing is for students and especially, I will say, populations of color, there's kind of this stigma around mental health. Oh, you know, if you go, you're, you're going to be seen as crazy. And we even saw this in March when we had to, when, you know, when most students went home, students didn't want to engage in services, some students, not all students, for fear of what the, their family would think, for fear of, you know, how they would be perceived. But understand that, you know, if you had um, an infection, if you had strep throat, if you had, I don't know, throw some out for me, Josh, uh, tonsillitis, something, you know, you'd go and talk to a doctor and think nothing of it. So in the same way, you know, for your mental health, and it's not a lifelong sentence. Oh my God, if I go to see a therapist, I'll be seeing them for the next five years. Mm -mm, what did I say? Short-term model. So it's not going to be like that. And for some students, all they need is one time just to come in and, and literally just to be able to dump it out and put it in a place. And after that, they're able to go on. But please don't shy away from mental health services because we can be incredibly valuable to helping you and to take charge of your academic success. Um, students have to self-advocate. And if that means plugging into mental health services so that they can be prepared to do that or talking to your professors or whatever it may be, be able to advocate for yourself. I can't say sleep, 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 enough. You know, um, students think that they're invincible and oh, you know, if I get two hours, I will be fine. But that's not what your body's saying. And, and I know that Josh, you can attest to me, attest with me that this is the case that every body needs sleep. So make sure that you're incorporating that into what you do. But on the other side, the clinician in me says, if you're sleeping 12 hours a day, might be a little depression there. So kind of monitor your sleep to make sure that, you know, if that's something that you need to attend to, that you're doing that. Eating, you know, this is a time because we're shut in, you know, it's real easy to say pizza, 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 or, you know, burgers and fries, that's all I'm going to eat. But, you know, make sure that you're still thinking about your, your eating in a healthy way. And you can't be all things for all people. You're not a superhero. Please, please, please take care of yourself in these times. Get the help that you need, whatever it may be, academic, financial aid, medical health, mental health, whatever it is. And this is one that I always challenge people, and I've challenged myself, and I'm really proud because I'm doing pretty well right now with this is find a way to relax every day and it doesn't mean that it has to be a long period of time it may be a 30 minute block that you say this is my time and it may be playing video games as long as that doesn't elevate your blood pressure which i know for some people it does um, but it may be video games it may just be listening to music and relaxing taking a bath you know whatever it might be for you but find a way to relax every day and find balance in your life as a college student um, even though you know, I teach as well, it's really not all about the academics. It is primarily about the academics, but it's not all about the academics. And you have to find a balance. At some point you walk away and you say, I can't look at this paper right now. I need to 
I don't know, play basketball, paint my nails, whatever it might be, but do something different so that you do have some balance in your life. And I think that is all that I wanted to share from that, that vantage point. And I hope that that's something that will be helpful and inspiring to our, our students. No, that's great. Thank you, Brenda. Josh, did you have any thoughts while she was running through that or any, anything you wanted to share? No, I feel better just hearing all that. Yeah, Thank you, Brenda. Right. I, good, good. It's our own little session right here. <laughs> <laughs> um, I couldn't help but uh, I, I was reminded when you said take a take a moment to to relax. Um, one of the days that I was running a lot of testing, and now we're running tests on campus, but uh, it takes 15 minutes for the test to run. So I found myself back in. Wait, I got there a few minutes before the test was ready to come up, and I had absolutely, you know, I didn't have to be anywhere else except wait for that yeah. test mm -hmm. and even though it was even though it was only three minutes i uh <laughs> i got myself in a comfortable body position and focused on myself and grounded myself a little bit and it was funny what a difference that makes so absolutely that really that really spoke to me brenda thank you Absolutely. You know, we have yoga classes uh, on campus at the Shumo Center. And there are, I did want to put a plug in for our website for the Counseling Center. Over the COVID season, I really ramped up and pulled a lot of resources together on relaxation techniques that you can do through YouTube. There's a lot of videos there. There's a lot of resources. There's even a crisis hotline if students may need them. There is a local hotline, a text line actually, a place that you can text, are you okay? And it's sponsored by Service Access to Management here locally. So if students are need somebody to text with or talk to after hours, um, and it's not something that you know you need to call public safety about or not feeling like a crisis, but just needing you know that connection that they are available, and that too is on the website. So there's lots of resources there for students that even if they don't feel like they need to come in to sit and talk to somebody, that they can access and will be very very helpful for them. Brenda, do you think, um, you know, since everything is moving to, to Zoom and, and online formats, do you think that that's going to help with access um, to mental health services, uh, since that is such a major, major issue uh, across, across the board? Um, for college students, I think that it might um, help them to feel more comfortable. But, you know, it, it's kind of a two-edged sword, to be real honest with you, Josh, because like I said before, for students that are at home, uh, we actually reached out to, um, in the spring, all of our students on our caseload from fall and spring. And I will say that a sm only a small percentage wanted to have any interaction. And those that did, even though we weren't set up for video telehealth at that time, we asked about that possibility and we were doing phone telehealth. They opted for phone telehealth because they did not want, um, you know, living situations and what you see, you know, so there's so many things that I'm really not sure that that's going to increase it a whole lot. I think for some students that um, have, especially on the spectrum, not a whole lot social, not wanting to come out, they will really enjoy doing the telehealth por portion of it. But I, just like the students on campus, you know, you have a, the option to be on or off campus, they're here. You know, they're coming in, they're preferring face-to-face. -face. Um, I'll be able to better answer that question, hopefully next semester when we can offer the option for video telehealth and face-to-face -face and to see what students opt for. But, you know, I, I guess at this point, I'm minimally optimistic because I think that some of those other things that I talked about earlier um, in terms of family situations, living situations, and things like that might not make telehealth the best option for and kind of related to that, Brenda, can you envision a scenario where someone's doing telehealth even on campus, like, like yes. not from their home, but even on yes, campus? Yes, absolutely. We've actually already made provisions for that. Um, we have three spaces on campus that are reserved specifically for telehealth, either for the health center or the counseling center. And as soon as, and even, I mean, now that you've said that, I need to, to put that into my plan for election um, week. Because if students, like they have a roommate and the roommate's always there and they don't want to do something while the roommate's there, that they could sign up and they, they just have 
have to let us know and then they can go to one of those spaces that will be their space for that time and be able to meet with a counselor there. So yes, as we're rolling this out, we are making provisions for on campus and off campus telehealth as well as face-to-face -face on campus. But thank you for asking that. Yeah. Josh, what, is, what else haven't we covered? Because I feel like Brenda's done a good job going over <laughs> various things here. Um, she did, she did. Um, I, guess, I think the term I saw, Brenda, was uh, re-entry anxiety. Um, do you, have you come across that term? I thought that was very interesting when, uh, when I first he heard that. Yes. Um, let, me, let me talk about it in a different way first and then come back to specifically what you're asking. So um, I remember one student in particular who came on campus, first year student, came on campus and immediately said, I have to go home. I have to go home. I, I, I can't be here now. You know, I don't know what her, she imagined would happen, but coming, being away from home and being around so many people and, you know, everybody, out, she just could not do it. So there's that issue of even entering, you know, coming from your home where you knew you could kind of control it. Remember, we talked about having that self-control as being a part of um, resiliency. So, you know, I'm only interacting with the other four people that are in my house. And now there's a thousand thousand people out here and you know some have masks some don't you know and there's somebody close in my living space that I did not grow up with I don't know about that so you have the entry piece and then of course you have the re-entry piece which is kind of the same dynamic is you know I'm coming back and um it feels a little strange because now I'm interacting with different people and going in different spaces. I don't know how they clean. I don't know, you know, what their, their philosophy is on all of this. I know what I'm trying to do, but are they trying to do the same thing? And then for upperclassmen, it's, well, I'm used to freely walking around campus. I'm used to, you know, being able to go to all of these activities. I'm used to being able to call in-person meetings and see my friends and do all of this. And I can't do any of that. And that's where we're starting to see the depression numbers increase. You know, students are yearning to have that social encounter, that face-to-face -face social encounter. They're tired of doing, they do Zoom for classes. They don't want their activities, their organizations to meet via Zoom. Um, and then it also has to do with your own personality. You know, if you are an extrovert and if you're very gregarious, then this is not working for you at all. You know, you're wanting that and you're trying to find ways to make that happen. You know, whether it's within the residence halls, whether it's within your student organization, whether it's just getting in your car and going to the mall because at least you'll be able to see people there, you know, and social distance or whatever, but you need that. But then for those that are not and are more introverts, it works perfectly. You know, I can have that distance. I can control when I see you, when I don't see you. You know, even when I go to my class, I can take my screen and flip it up so you're not actually looking at me and looking into my eyes. I don't have that kind of stress. So, you know, personality dynamics really play into it as well. Um, but we, ha we have, I think, been mindful of that whole re-entry piece. And I think that Albright has tried. And of course, you have to, you know, the pandemic has to take priority. And so, so there, there are rules and regulations, like I know some of the student groups that I advise, you know, we would prefer to be able to have regularly, weekly, face-to-face -face meetings. That can't happen. So, you know, those adjustments are difficult, um, they're stressful, but they're necessary. And even helping people to understand why, you know, rather than imposing a rule and saying, this is the rule, because that doesn't feel like I have any control. And then that, that spirals me out in terms of my coping mechanisms. But if I can understand this is why this is happening and this is the time frame that we're using, there's a point where we will reevaluate and then we may be able to move towards something else. And um, student activities, a shout out to student activities, they're trying to provide things within those guidelines that still kind of give students that ability to connect. Um, but it's difficult. It, it, there's nothing easy about what we're going through now. And that goes back to, you know, giving yourself that grace and understanding that, you know, I'm going to react to this. 
you know, I want to see my friends. I'm going to see my friends now. So I might melt down. You know, maybe I've never had a meltdown in the last two years, but I feel myself freaking out a little bit here, you know, but to understand that that's a natural part of it, kind of give yourself some grace with that and, and, and then pick up from there and move on. You know, you can't stay on the floor and kick and scream for two days, but you can do it for an hour. That's okay. You know, but giving yourself kind of permission and almost anticipating that these things are going to happen, you know, that nothing's going to be the same. I mean, we see that, I see this in other contexts that um, people just, they're waiting, they're sitting and they're waiting for things to get back to the way they used to be. And my response to them is that's not going to happen ever again. You know, some things may move toward where they used to be, but we are in essence creating a new normal and we need to embrace that. The sooner you're able to embrace that, the more healthy you're going to be and the more solid your mental health will be. And just to accept that given what we have learned from this pandemic and the experiences that we are having, that there are things that will never go back to the way they used to be, but that new can be better. You know, that it doesn't, it's not doom and gloom that, oh my God, it's new and it's going to be worse and it's going to be horrible, but new can be better. And we have a hand in creating what that newness is going to be. So, you know, you can have some control over where the future is going and that's exciting. That's a good point, Brenda. <laughs> yeah. It put a put a positive spin on the whole thing. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, personally, in all aspects of my life, I am really excited about the possibilities that this pandemic has brought. And, and you know, we I've had sorrow. I've lost family members to COVID. So, you know, I've seen the ravages of it and the negativity of it. And I've hurt. And, you know, there's things that I wanted to do that I couldn't do. There's things that my kids have participated in that they're not participating in now. And that's painful for me as a parent. But I also see, I really see a silver lining. I see growth in our understanding of things and that there are great possibilities. And, and I, for me, you know, from a mental health vantage point, that's kind of where I have to live. And I encourage other people to kind of embrace that. And to think about what are the possibilities? You know, how can we live life in a new and, and more vibrant way than we have in the past? Do you by chance moonlight as a, as a motivational speaker? <laughs> <laughs> That is, it's when I retire, is that is lifting. something that I have thought about because I, <laughs> that's my passion, you know, just encouraging people and helping them to be the best that they can be and to bring perspective, different perspectives right. um, to situations. So absolutely, I, I do that a little bit now, not as much as I would like to, but in another life at another time when yeah. you know, I'm not doing all of these things, yes, I can see myself. I feel like, I feel like this afternoon, I'm just going to go... I'm just gonna grab it and go get it. <laughs> hey, okay, my job here is done. <laughs> right, right, right. No, but you bring up a lot of good points, and 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 I've noticed myself like you know if I'm kind of like just getting a little down and all the monotony and the, all the zoom and my eyes are burning because I'm looking at a screen all day, even just like going out for a walk around the neighborhood or something, some physical activity. Um, or, or some meditation, some mindfulness, just like, yes. just do something to kind of just, so it's a really good point. I've tried to do that as well. Good, good. So. Yes, it does make a difference and it does help. And the point that you make about little tidbits of time, you know, sometimes people are waiting, you know, well, I don't have enough time to do this or that or the other, you know, but five minutes makes a difference. 10 minutes makes a difference. You know, it doesn't have to be 30 minutes or an hour. Any little time that you can take out to do some self-care will make a difference. And again, um, there's some really nice, really brief meditation exercises and relaxation exercises that are on the Counseling Center's webpage that doesn't, they don't take a lot of time for people. Um, and the other thing is, if you have a, an um, Apple Watch, one of the things I just started wearing mine again recently, but there's a Breathe app on there that, you know, it's, it's 60 seconds, but I've started to take the time just to do that. It'll ding and remind you, which I need because you get caught up in things and just doing that deep breathing and recentering and then moving forward. Very cool. Josh, did you, did you want to bring up anything else? Um... No, that was great, Brenda. Thank you very much.
Yeah. Absolutely. This, this was wonderful. Um, I, I was excited to be here and hopefully I said something, one little thing at least, that will spark someone to take better care of themselves and their mental health and use our services as they need. We are available and eagerly waiting to provide services to our students. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Um, so this concludes episode number 11. Uh, thank you, Josh. Until, until next time. Thanks, Adam. Thanks, and, Brenda. And Brenda, thank, thank you. you so have a good day. All right, you have a great day. Take care, everyone. Bye. You too. Bye-bye.